good morning. It's morning, right? It's, it's afternoon where I come from. But as a matter of fact, the radio program is starting right now, or they're, they're, they're just getting into it right now. So now I have a sense of what it's like here. Do, are, you, are many of you familiar with our radio program, Catholic Answers Live? OK, good. Well, good. Oh, you are. Chris, Chris Check, our president, is. That's good. Um, <laughs> But we also do a, a television program made f mostly from the, the, the radio show, and that, is, that airs on EWTN television. Uh, how many of you, I don't know about the access to EWTN. Are you familiar with EWTN? And that's, the, right? Okay. Uh, okay, good. So you know what trouble the Catholic world is in. Uh, you've seen their programming. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> I mean, the, the, I don't mean that to insult their programming, just that it, it, it's impossible to tune into Catholic media and not know that there, we're, we face a lot of uh, troubles. Uh, and we face a lot of troubles in the wider world. Um, I come from California. That's where our home base is, uh, California. Uh, you've heard of California. Um, uh, you're welcome for all that we've done for the world uh, in California, uh, making the world a better place. Uh, it's, it, I don't know how it is here. I know that you have had uh, here in, in this part of Australia a, a kind of a debate about abortion and, and uh, I, d I gather it has not all gone well uh, in that uh, regard. So um, that's not even a debate we have in California. I mean, California, in the United States, you, you really can't change abortion laws because the Supreme Court tells us what the laws are on abortion. But it doesn't matter. In California, they just keep voting for more and more extreme abortion laws. And, and they, it, they don't actually have an effect. They will if the Supreme Court over... Uh, turns a, a certain judgment in the U.S. called Roe versus Wade, but but it's just a mania for it, you know, a mania to kind of one up, uh, you know, to be more um, deadly, I suppose, as a state. Um, we also have uh, in the United States, um, and particularly, I would say, California is at the forefront here of a transgender movement. I, I don't know how how effect is that having an effect here, and and. Uh, you know, of course, um, we, we, charity requires that we're, we don't be, become polemicists about this, but also charity requires that we not uh, give up basic things like that there's a difference between boys and girls, which by law there is not in the state of California, okay? So we have outlawed boys and girls. Um, again, you're welcome. Um, so that's coming here, I suppose. So what, what I did want to do, and, and Ian got to this, is talk about how did we get to this, and it, it's related to the overall Christian story. So what I would like to do in the four hours that I have with you this morning <laughs> is, sorry, I don't, apparently that's, I don't have four hours, but Jen will tell me when I'm over. Jen, Jen comes with, she tells me when we're getting near the end, but I, I want to just briefly do a little bit of history with you, uh, just uh, starting with Adam and Eve and up to our uh, current day. That should That'll be the first half of the talk, okay? And then we'll talk about uh, the particular problems that we face. But I, I particularly want to do the last 500 years of, of uh, history. And I will uh, focus a bit on Europe. And even, even in California, I, t I give this talk and people are like, well, why is it so Eurocentric? Because like the worst thing that you can be in California is Eurocentric, all right? So, but there is a reason for that, and I will address that as we go, because, but the basic thing I think we can all acknowledge is that modernity, the modern world that we have, is a thing that began in Europe, flowered in Europe, and now is transferring to the rest of the world. It has certain co consequences uh, that are positive and others that are negative. We, as a society, and I mean this global modern society, we tend to focus on the positives, and then we tend to exaggerate certain negatives, but there's a whole story underneath that story of what really happened in the modern world, and, and, and it's not hidden, it's out in plain view. We just don't ever really do much to give an organized telling of that story. And the reason that I just briefly will begin with Adam and Eve is because you're aware, probably, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know how catechesis is here in Australia, um, but you're aware that God created human beings. This, yes, you are. Okay, all right, good. That's fair enough. Uh, I'm not going to get into how uh, he did that. That's Carlo. Uh, he understands the mind of God. I don't uh, claim to. But um, I, but God created human beings. Human beings uh, were in in the original creation of human beings 
we're created with the grace to be in intimate friendship, relationship with God. One that if we, if we don't rebel against God can result in our making progress towards perfection and living forever in glory with God. Well, of course, they sinned, right? They, they ate an apple, uh, but it is not actually an apple. But, you know, but you know, this, the idea there is there is a primordial state of human beings that's a real thing that really did happen. We don't know its historical circumstances. We don't know the where's and the when's and the how's that it happened. But there is a primordial state of human beings in which we enjoy the grace of a relationship with God that is pure. At some point, that breaks. Whatever the, and, and it breaks because of an unwillingness to do what God tells us. And then the entire story of Hebrew scriptures, in a way, um, really gets going with the story of Abram, Abraham, right? So Adam and Eve and the fall and then Noah and then the Tower of Babel, which is an extremely important story. It's very, very short, but you get the story of the Tower of Babel. That is, people are going to build a tower to the heavens, okay? We, in other words, human beings, after having repopulate or beginning to repopulate the east and coming out of the east after Noah's flood, we're going to build a tower to heaven. The, the, the implication here is, we will get high enough that if another flood comes, you won't be able to kill us, and we'll make it to the abode of God on our own, okay? And then God was like, mm, I don't think so. He got so mad that he was like, now some of you have to speak French. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's mad, right? That's an angry God. Uh, so at least that's what happens in the story is that, the, the, okay, we get the, the world is, is divided. And, th and there's a, these, this is a common form of myth from the ancient world is this is how we got languages. This is how, the, it's the myth that tells how we got certain things. But it's also, uh, because it's God's word, it also carries a whole other level of human beings cannot build a tower to heaven. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do. They tried to steal it. That's what the people of Noah's tri time tried to do by their immorality. They try and here again, you're just fresh off of that and you try to build that tower. So off you go, and now you're, you figure it out for yourselves, but you, you, can't, you can't even understand each other anymore. I've muddled the languages, okay? And so there's a, a little intervening chapter, but then immediately after, except for that small intervening chapter, there, after the story of the Tower of Babel, there was a man named Abram, okay? And it tells specifically, historically, where he comes from, what his town is, who his people are, and about what he is like, and about how God, very specific stories about how God interacts with Abram, who comes to have the name Abraham, and his wife Sarah, and then, so what we have here is the beginning of a rescue story. Right? So we have the stories of calamity in the first 11 chapters of, of the book of Genesis, and now a rescue story starts. And there's a certain way in which the stories in the first 11 chapters are poetic, and they have a kind of, we're not, they're not set at a specific moment in time or history. They're just telling us that these repeated falls of humanity have happened, and now God has called Abram out of the land of the Chaldees, to something new, start a new project. So you have essentially a new history that starts within the overall history of humanity. And we call that history, the, the, the fancy term for it is salvation history now, right? We have a, a history of God's working out the salvation of the world. Well, the story that we often tell ourselves in the modern world is that is, it's, it doesn't have this salvation history aspect. What it has is there's a lot of different religions and superstitions. And starting in a, in the, roughly in the 14, 15, 1600s, people started to overcome all that. And a new thing started in the world, an overcoming of religious superstition. And, 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 the, and the, so much so, so, we're so kind of attached to this story that what happened either six or five or 400 years ago, starting sometime in that period, we're so wedded to the story that what happened is basically a, 
a light started to dawn. We even use terms like enlightenment and age of discovery and all, all that. Okay, so the, the lights started to come on and we started to realize, oh, these are just a bunch of stories. Muhammad and his stories and Abram and his stories and Moses and the Buddha and the, you know, the whoever, the Taoists or the Confucians or the Hindus. It's a, this is all stories because people lived in the darkness of kind of a, they had to tell themselves stories because they didn't know anything. And then a light started to dawn. And this is what we call modernity. And so if you say anything against the modern world, you will often, and this has happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times over the last about two or three hundred years. What, do you want to take us back to the Dark Ages? Like you, what, what, you want us to go back to the Dark Ages? They'll even, you'll see it in the newspapers today. They'll still use that phrase. You want to go back to the Dark Ages? Now, this is when the Dark Ages happened, okay? Never. So um, that's a story. That's a made-up story, the story of the Dark Ages, the story of it's all dark and then this light starts to dawn. Well, where did this light come from? What is the nature of this light? Why did suddenly, about 500 years ago, and this part is true, people start to make really stunning technological advances and scientific uh, discoveries. And what happened that the world, say, of 1800 is so very different from the world of 1300 in a way that the world of 1300 is not different from the world of 500 or 500 BC or 1000 BC. Something really did happen. But we have a, a uh, only half the story. We only tell half the story. And so I want to start the conference by talking a little bit about the hidden story, the story that we do not talk about, about what happened over the last 500 years. And I say 500 years for a very specific reason that you will get. Others might say, well, it's really, it goes back to the founding of the Italian maritime republics, you know, we'll say in the 13, 1400s. Others will say, well, it's really, it's kind of started with the, with the scientific revolutions and, and those are, are more 16, 1700s. I place it on a certain day, actually, October 31st, 1517. <laughs> That's when the modern world started. Uh, because they just had an amazing Halloween blowout that year, and <laughs> the, or something else happened. Does anybody know? October 31st, 15. Oh, Tim knows. Um, the old 95 theses. The uh, I, and, and we don't know exactly. Um, I mean, there is some historical debate about it, what what actually is happening at that moment. But this, but certainly on that day. Martin Luther is calling for a debate about several things. Primary among them apparently is this, are indulgences, but it's all related, of course, to the role of priests, to the role of purgatory, all, all this. So uh, if you think about this century and a half before Martin Luther, you see a, a series of things happening that, I mean, in the 1300s, where Europe is recovering from the, the plague, population is starting to reestablish itself, but Europe is poor in large part because of the plague, except for certain places, like again, the, the Italian Maritime Republics that actually got rich following the plague because of a certain kind of accumulation of middle-class wealth there before the plague. But, but after the, the plague of the 1300s, Europe's population drops precipitously. By the way, in America, we do not start a talk by explaining the evacuation plan. What is that about? I'm very nervous. Like, does this happen a lot in Australia? Do you just have to evacuate and you meet up at the rally point? Is there? So I apparently have not been fully briefed on what, whatever is happening here in Australia. But wait, how did I get off on that? Oh yeah, because of the plague. I don't know, maybe, uh, so that got... So the, the drop in the population and, and the poverty that follows and, the, and also a, a certain stress on the institutions of Europe um, means, okay, in the 1400s, Europe is recovering. So the sense that we have of something's happening in Europe in the 1400s is really true. Also, the invention of the printing press. This is world transformative, the, with the invention of movable type printing press. It's very much like the internet. Try to think of what the world was like before the internet. Are there young people here? There was a world before the internet. Uh, and then try to think of 
what, how vastly different the world is now as a consequence of the internet, and we've only begun that, okay? That's very much like what happened with the inventing of movable type printing. The, the, the change in the way that information is disseminated had tremendous consequences for culture, okay? But then also, just in 1492, Columbus, um, are you, okay, you are familiar with Columbus. I don't know how they teach history. Okay, you are. Okay, all right. I didn't know if it was all like, um, uh, he discovered America, right, for, uh, America had actually already been discovered several times, but he's, it stuck when it, with him, okay? He's, it stuck when Columbus did it. And, and Chris can tell you about Columbus. Great, wonderful story, but can you imagine the revolution in the thinking of, let's just say Christian Europe, to discover there is an entire world that they did not know existed before that. And this happens in the context of the growing population of Europe, the growing wealth of Europe of the 1400s, and, and in, the, in the time of the printing press, so that you have this um, ability to share this information about a world that literally they didn't know existed. So if you think about world geography to the Christian mind, there's Asia, there's Africa, there's Europe. And right at the nexus point of the world, the Savior is born. The whole story, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the prophets, the kings, all of that, it happens right where the nexus of the world is. It has a certain kind of clear logic to medieval Christians that of what has happened. God has come right to the middle of the world, and Christianity spreads out from there. And in the, so in the 1500s, as it starts to dawn on them, that, that's not what the world looks like at all. Like they knew the world was round, of course. They just didn't know that there was another world out there in the ocean, North America and South America. Okay, they thought you just could sail to Japan. And by the way, the, the people, particularly the, uh, the uh, clergy uh, who told Columbus not to sail west. They didn't say because you're going to fall off the end of the earth. They said because you cannot make it to Japan from here. It's too far. You'll die. You'll starve and you'll run out of fresh water by the time you get there. They were right. Columbus got lucky. He, was, he just ran into a, a, the other half of the planet, right? So, but, but they were right in their calculations. So imagine the world of 1517 then, a, a world of tremendous change. And even Christ himself doesn't seem to have come to the middle of the world. He, you can kind of see he just came to any old place. It's not the middle of the world. Okay? So um, we have then, after Martin Luther, a, what I would call the birth of the modern world. And I say that it's the birth of the modern world with Martin Luther. I am convinced of this. Others might say 1492 is the year. Others might say Gutenberg's press was the, the year. Other people might uh, put it a little later, a little farther into the future, maybe with, uh, well, I no, maybe some people might put it back with like Brunelleschi's dome or the, you know, the creation of modern engineering and mathematics-based science, or, or some might put it later with the discoveries of uh, people like Isaac Newton or uh, uh, his, uh, the other scientists, you know or, or uh, Galileo, those. But I would put it at 1517 uh, for a particular reason. That the shattering of Christianity that happened at 1517 introduces a, essentially a new religious understanding into the world. And it's an understanding that is necessarily individualistic. That's what it is to be modern, is to be an individual. This comes directly from Martin Luther's idea that the church is not a liturgical communion, but is based on sola scriptura, the word alone, the word of God alone, okay? And so that means what's important is I read the word, I relate to God, so it's individualistic. The other quality, however, of, that comes from Martin Luther, somewhat directly, I would say, is it's rationalistic. If all we have is the word, written word, then our future is based on written arguments, okay? So we, the, the modern mind believes that what is in writing is important in a way that no people before thought of that. And this comes directly from Sola Scriptura. And so whoever can make the best argument in writing 
is, is supposed to win the day. This, this written rationalism, being individualist and rationalist, is modern. Okay? And you can see it in a particular way uh, in the fact that countries now, except apparently for the UK, I'm not sure how things work in the UK, but every other country has a written constitution. Okay? Written constitutions are very modern in that here we found something based on the written word. We as individuals gathered together found we, something real is born into the world as we validate this constitution because what matters is individuals choosing and putting it down in writing. Okay, and so we see the roots of the modern world in that. And we see that in our attachment to things like written contracts. Okay, and the modern obsession with data, data, data. Okay, so I say that Martin Luther founded the modern world when he asked for an argument. And the argument, he, that's what he's doing. He's asking for an argument. I want to enter into an argument with you. Not in a, I don't use the word pejoratively, but he's rooting history now in argument. Whoever has the better argument is going to be the winner of history. And the argument that he will put forward is essentially individualistic. We're all individuals, and you've got this rational mind, and that is what makes the world modern. Now, so much so that if you say to people, modern people, is it good that the world became rationalistic and individualistic? Almost all modern people will say, yes, that's a great advance for the world. And they will say that in part because they are convinced that what became before it is dark and ugly. And this is where the modern world is itself a kind of act of propaganda. The entire modern world is a kind of act of propaganda. We'll say that this is what history is like, we'll say that this is what people are like, and we'll say it over and over and over again until it is deeply and profoundly believed. And many of the things that are said are really good things. Like we, individual rights have flourished in the modern world. That is a good. But the story will continue. Well, now we are more ra rational and individualistic. And now we make a series of advances in which the world makes progress. Progress, progress, progress. And this is the other thing that we are addicted to in the modern world and Martin Luther is the progenitor of this, is revolutions. We are essentially revolutionary. We love technological revolutions. We love revolutions in art. We are constantly turning over the old and establishing the new. Turning over the old and establishing the new. And the new is good to the degree that it is better for the individual. Okay? And that's what we do. And we see these revolutions then. We glorify them. The scientific revolution. Right? The Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the, and, and many other, the, we Americans, we love our American Revolution, which is not a revolution in the proper sense, but you see the overturning of the old, the establishing of the new, based on individualistic, rationalist arguments. And that means, that's why we have Twitter now, okay? Because people got liberated from all that old tribe and family and community, they got liberated from all those old stories and superstitions and they started to think for themselves, speak up, get some girl power and, or whatever the p particular power of the moment is and that's how the world makes its advances and its progress. It's not a dumb story because we do in fact have Twitter and we have rocket ships and we have automobiles and we have toasters. I mean, think about it, they didn't even have toasters. Well, they probably did, but, um, but they were over a fire or whatnot. We have electric toaster, we have electricity, okay? Like all, there's all these goods that you can easily point to and say, well, that was a good idea. Modernity was a good idea. And we're all familiar with that story and we're uncomfortable interrupting it at all. But the problem with the story is that it, in order to achieve its propaganda value, it has to lie about what came before it. And I don't mean make a mistake or be an error. I mean lie about what came before it. Okay? Children are taught in schools, even Catholic schools around the world, that the modern world represents an overcoming 
of the medieval. That is exactly the opposite of the true, of the truth. The modern world is born from the successes of the medieval people, not from their failures. The first modern hospital still operating in London, formed in the year in the, in the 11th century. Okay, I don't have the exact year, I apologize. Tim will have it. Uh, uh, 11th century, still functioning as a hospital, okay? The first modern university, and the other word for modern university is just university. There is no such thing. Before, people will tell you, oh, they had universities in the, the ancient here, but no, they didn't. Where you can get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a doctorate, where you have specific faculties for specific uh, disciplines, where you are expected to be proficient in mathematics, where you're expe expected to be proficient in rhetoric, in philosophy, if you're going to graduate from the university. By the way, when I say you're expected to be proficient in these things, I'm, I'm talking about like 40 years ago, okay? That ended about 40 years ago, but you used to get an education at a university, okay? So the first university then is the University of Paris, where Thomas Aquinas, well, you could have at one time found Thomas Aquinas and every other great mind. And then universities start popping up in places like Great Britain and in places like uh, Poland and Italy. And because the Catholic Church was a universal church in the medieval period, and by the, by the way, when I refer to Catholic Church, in my own mind, this is just a little, I, I mean liturgical Christianity the way that Jesus founded it. That is, do this in memory of me, okay? And you could say, well, there was a split between the East and West. Yeah, but nobody ever, ever created a new religion in which liturgy is not the center of Christian life, okay? That's what happened with Martin Luther, is liturgy, the sacraments, are no longer the center of Christian life. And liturgy and the sacraments are a communal undertaking. Communal Christianity, the only sane kind of Christianity, the only possible Christianity that the Lord could have intended because he said things like found my church and that kind of things and do this in memory of me and go and make disciples of the nation and all. The only possible sensible Christianity is a communal shared Christianity. Well, let's call it something wild like a church, okay? The, the sundering of that in 1517 is a turning point. It's nothing at all like the various schisms and problems that came before that. So you could have gone to Mass in Iceland in the year 1100. You could have gone to Mass in Jerusalem. You could have gone to Mass in Kiev. You could have gone to Mass in Barcelona. This is one big culture, multi-ethnic, multilingual culture. It's like the dream of the modern liberal. That's what they had right? The world's first multi-ethnic, multilingual, unified culture, such that the Pope could say to an Italian guy, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have trouble with names for a moment here, but like Anselm, I think it was Anselm, he's an Italian guy, he could say, hey, you need to go to England to be a bishop at Canterbury, and the English, they don't say, we don't want an Italian, they just welcome Anselm because that's the way their mind was. A bishop is a bishop. You can come from wherever. You can go to the University of Paris and your degree is good in Warsaw. All right, this is the world that they built. Hospitals, universities, and cathedrals. And this is what Catholics do everywhere we go. We sanctify because Christ sanctified, and that's what a church is for, makes things holy, makes people holy. We teach because that's what Christ did. He taught. He was the teacher. He taught with authority. They had never heard anyone teach with such authority. So where Catholics go, you will find people being educated. And we care for the sick. Everywhere Catholics go, you will find hospitals, infirmaries, um, uh, uh, monasteries that care for people now what the monasteries used to do are done by things like hospice these are the three things you will find everywhere on earth the Catholics go churches hospitals universities these are the foundations of the modern world 
It was the church that made it possible to have a multicultural, multilingual society. Because if the church is the center of your life, then your tribe or nation is not. The church, the physical building of the church, made it possible to have a multilingual, multicultural society. The universities made it possible for learning to, be, to take on a global perspective such that scholars were talking to one another. You know, the Copernicus over here has an effect on the next guy over here and the next guy over there. So that when we talk about the scientific method, you might notice that there is actually no such thing as a scientific method. No one's ever been able to define the scientific method because it doesn't exist. What was created by the church was a community of scholars in which knowledge could be um, retained and expanded. This is the foundation of the modern world. In the, uh, from the university's perspective, in the teaching of the, and the science of the modern world is rooted in those medieval hospitals. And they were real hospitals. They weren't like some backwater thing. I mean, the hospitals that last 900 years, today you can go to Europe and go to hospitals that were founded in the Middle Ages. These are not fly-by-night operations where they just think, oh, you know, I don't know, let's do some magic. These are scientific institutions. These are the, what the Catholic Church gave the world of 1400 and 1500 and 1600. A world that could be unified as a culture because it could be sanctified in churches. Because my baptism made me a brother to the guy in Kiev and the guy uh, in Africa and the guy in Iceland, all the same. Okay? A world of learning because of the first the monastery schools and then the universities that grew out of them, and a world of science rooted in, in uh, the, the beginning of the hospital movement, which is entirely a Christian undertaking. The world never saw a hospital movement like it uh, erupted in Europe in the uh, high Middle Ages, because that's what Christians have done from the very beginning. It's in the scripture about how the caring for the sick and the poor is a mark of the early Christians, okay? So what is, what the medieval world bequeaths to the modern world, what they gave to us is a multicultural, multilingual society of high learning and advanced science. What we are going to bequeath to whatever comes after the modern world is probably nuclear fallout and sex tapes. Who had a better culture? It's a lie to say that the modern world is a recovery from the superstition of the, of the ancients and the medieval people. The modern world grows out of their great devotion and success. That's how we got the modern world. And it really is as good as it seems. Its goods really are tremendously good. But the story of something being broken in 1517 does not stop with the divide between Catholics and Protestants. The divide between liturgical Christianity and individualized Christianity. And liturgical Christianity is the Christianity of Christ. It cannot be said enough. Again and again, he makes motions that show us that his, his own ministry is a liturgical ministry. If you're blind and you're speaking to God incarnate, he can heal you just by saying you're healed. If he spits in, on, on the dirt and makes mud and puts it on your eyes, he's saying liturgy is what you need to be healed. That's how I'm going to heal you. Again and again and again in the scriptures we see our Savior saving us liturgically. And of course culminating at the Last Supper. So the loss of the shattering of liturgical Christianity is a real loss. And it means the world cannot be unified in the way that medieval Europe was. And here let me just say a thing about, uh, just a quick word about being Eurocentric, because it really bugs some people that this is so, such a Eurocentric talk. Christianity is not Eurocentric. Christi the, Christianity is Eurocentric because after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the apostles go out in every direction. They go to India. They go to uh, all parts of Asia that they can get to. They go to Africa. They go to Europe. Everywhere in the known world, Christianity spent. You've heard of Genghis Khan, right? His mother was a Christian because Christian missionaries had made it to 
all the way out to the steppes of Europe, hundreds of years before the stories now tell you that they got there. These were what were called, the, are sometimes called the Nestorian Christians. So Christianity is not a Eurocentric thing. Christianity went out into the world. Every direction it could go out from Jerusalem. That's really what St. Luke's Gospel is about. It starts in Jerusalem, goes out to the whole world. Okay? Well, what happened? Why did it become so Eurocentric? Because it was brutally cut in half in the 7th and 8th centuries, and the 9th century, and the 10th century. Because Muhammad came. And because he, at the tip of a sword, converted all of North Africa, all of Arabia, large parts of Asia. So you, it's right in the middle of Christendom, right in the middle of Christianity, there's this big scar. After Muhammad, Europeans stop using gold coins. What this tells you is they no longer had access to the gold mines of Africa. They were cut off from Africa, so they start using coins that are made what, from European metals. And so that's why the story becomes a European story from that point onward. But as we see now, Christians per persisted and persevered e in the East. The Christians of India, the Christians of, of uh, Iran, the Christians of uh, Ur of the Chaldees, now called Iraq, they persisted. The Christians of Ethiopia, they were there. But the story becomes a European story because the Pope in Rome is now cut off because of the expansion of Islam. So if you want to say, well, you, you Christians are Eurocentric colonialists, the only reason we're Eurocentric is because we were attacked and sundered from one another. That's it. It was not a thing that Christians chose. And it's true that Europe became arrogant because it became rich and well-educated as a consequence of its abiding Christian faith. Okay? So, by the year 1517, with the sundering of Christianity, it is true that a process of what we might call progress has begun because of this individualist, rationalist, um, argumentative, uh, revolutionary culture that is born out of Protestantism. But that revolution, that sundering, is not the end of the story. Following the Protestant Reformation, the Southern Europe continues to be very wealthy, and we have the Italian Renaissance, and then we have the broader Renaissance uh, in, in Europe, and even the word Renaissance, right, rebirth. It's this idea that, I don't know what happened before, but we're being born again here. Um, but they, these are genuine things. The Renaissance has happened. Then a great deal of wealth and education, particularly in France. And then a new movement starts in France, a new kind of Protestantism of the French philosophers, the French philosophes, people like Voltaire, Voltaire and Rousseau. And for them, they don't want to just get rid of the liturgical Christianity of France. They have moved beyond Jesus. Okay? So there's a second revolution, basically starting in France, but spreading out from there, where Protestantism started in Germany. This revolution starts in France, and it's a, a rejection of Jesus. And then we have figures like in the United States, the founders of our country were either Protestant Christians or deists. Okay, deists is a, a, a I mean, essentially, they have not let go of God. Like right in our Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, himself not a Christian at all. He is not a Protestant. He is not a Catholic. He is a deist. Right in the Declaration of Independence, he refers to nature and nature's God. That's where our rights come from, nature and nature's God. So this, is, this is, comes from France. And he was a, a, a noted Francophile, Thomas Jefferson. And as, you've already, as I've already said earlier, the French are basically a God's curse from the Tower of Babel. So uh, that's not true, all right? I just want you to know this, and I, I mean this sincerely. My jokes are funny in America. So in case, if you're like, that dude, that's sad. Okay, but in America, that's funny stuff. Um, okay, so this new thing is born then. We can have God without Christ. Before, we could have Christ without a church. Now we can have God without Christ. 
And this too is a loss because the loss of Christ, whether preached by Protestants or, or by Catholics, the loss of Christ now in a Europe that got wealthier and wealthier as things went on is a genuine loss of connection to the revelation that makes the world make sense. And so you start to have, um, of course, if anything happens in Europe, the Germans are going to overdo it. And so then you have the growth of German philosophy, right, in response to the French philosophers and the German philosophers. And you end up with people like Friedrich Nietzsche and, and Karl Marx who are done with God, not just with, with uh, Jesus, but with God. And so we have essentially the Catholic Church in, the mo in modern Europe. We have, and let's say modern, let's put that around, say, 1920. In, the, in modern Europe, we have Catholics, we have Protestants, we have uh, non-Christian deists, people who believe in nature and nature's God, and we have atheists. Okay? And so you can look at the modern world as a series of progresses, but also as a series of declines. And this is the story we don't like to tell. And if you tell it, people will say, what do you want to go back to the Dark Ages? And I'm like, yeah, I'd like to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine. All right? Um, I don't know why I picked Eleanor of Aquitaine. It's just, I don't know. Or I, um, the Venerable Bede. Actually, I'd rather meet Eleanor of Aquitaine than the, than the Venerable Bede. But, so you see a series of losses. Once you have sundered the church, then the loss of Christ follows. Once you have let go of Christ, the loss of God follows. But the th main thing when I say whatever happened to the modern world is that you should know that about the year 1900, all of these groups, maybe least of which Catholics, maybe the Catholics were least vulnerable to this probably, but all of these groups are in a state of tremendous optimism about the future around the year 1900 because of progress, because of scientific progress. I mean, they've got railroads, they've had the Industrial Revolution, they've got all kinds of stuff, they've got canned food, you know, they've got telephones and electricity, and there's a tremendous optimism around the year 1900, okay? Catholics least of all because basically it's hard to make a Catholic optimistic about the future, <laughs> right? Um, but certainly there's this sense that now all this modern progress we've made is just going to bear fruit in the 20th century. That went well. Um, okay, so a, a mere 14 years later, you have the beginning of the First World War. And the beginning of the, the First World War was fought over with the, the main principle that they were fighting over. Just in your mind, just recall to your mind, the principle they were fighting over in the First World War was there must have been a principle, right? There was something that they were fighting over. I mean, the, Europe was, there had to be a reason. It's a hundred years and we still cannot figure out why did they fight World War I? The Germans believed exactly what the British believed. Okay, the Italians and the Austrians. I'm not throwing the Turks in there for a reason, but you, you, the Russians, they're the same people. Why did they fight that war? It's because the ideas of the 19th century came to fruition. The ideas of people like Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche. And to some degree, you have to blame Darwin as well, even though he's kind of, uh, it, he's not as at fault as misinterpretations of Darwin are. And you have to, military thinkers like von, von Clausewitz. So you get an, a, a Europe in 1914 that believes in balance of power, spending tremendous sums on arms and convinced that as long as they can keep this balance, it's like a contraption they have built. When you talk about balance, it's like a, uh, they think now that history is a mechanical contraption and that we have figured out how to manage this mechanical contraption and as long as the Germans have this and the British have that and the Austrians have that and the Russians have this and, and nobody gets too out of sync technologically and nobody can overpower anybody militarily. See how the world is now a machine. We've turned the world into a machine. And when you turn the world into the, a machine, then there's people who are not human who will man manipulate that machine. And those persons are what we call demons. The First World War is clearly a demonic outbreak. In June, they're at peace. By August, they're killing each other by the tens of thousands per day. It's, it's a demonic thing that happened. 
Because if the world is a machine, if the world is a structure, it's no longer human. The human element is missing because the divine element is missing. When the divine is missing, our own humanity eventually goes missing and we start to think of the world as a machine, as a balance, as a system, as a set of systems, as a tower maybe, a tower in a great city, and we're building that tower up to heaven and we can handle this ourselves. And we're back to the beginning of history. We're back to the Tower of Babel. You can bet, because we now know how these things go. In the 21st century, we now know how these things go. When they were building the Tower of Babel, there were certain people who called it progress. And as they called it progress, they insulted anybody and marginalized anybody who said, I don't think that is progress. I'd like to go back to the farm. The Bible says the reason they built the tower is they wanted to make a name for themselves. We know what that means. We've been through the 20th century. We know what it means when a group gets together and wants to make a name for themselves as superior to other people. And if you get in their way, they will mow you under. They will kill you. They will kill your family. They will destroy your country. That's what it means to build the Tower of Babel. That's why God interrupted it. Because we know now what even the ancient people didn't know. If you decide as just bare-toothed, vicious human beings that we as a people, as a Volk, are going to make a name for ourselves, you're going to have to kill a lot of other people. You're going to have to destroy a lot. You're going to have a will to power. We've seen what it means to build a Tower of Babel, and that's what is happening in the year 1900, and that's why we get the First World War, and then the Second World War, and then Holocaust. Do, do you not see demons at work here? And the nuclear vaporization of cities, of innocent people. I am an American. We did that. That's not right. You don't attack innocent women and children no matter how noble your cause is. You certainly don't vaporize them in an instant. And so I've got you up now to 1945. That's pretty good. We started with Adam and Eve. We're at 1945 right now, okay? <laughs> like, I don't know how much you paid, but you just got your money's worth, all right? So what happens after 1945? Did we learn our lesson that we're, we're not supposed to be a, a people building a great city and a great tower? We're not supposed to be a people making a name for ourselves. We're supposed to be God's people, loving one another. And then all these things that medieval Europeans had, they come from that. Science and technology and, and um, multiculturalism and love, all of that comes. But if you turn the world into a machine, that is a world of, it doesn't even matter if that world blows up. It's already inhuman. It's already a horrible thing. So after 1945, people came to their senses and they said, look, we were wrong. We shouldn't have gotten rid of God. We shouldn't have turned away from Christ. We shouldn't have let go of the unified church that Christ gave us. And that's why everybody on earth is Catholic now. <laughs> so, did that, not, did that news not come to Australia? Have you guys not? Now everyone's Catholic, and we all love each other. We celebrate the sacraments. No, we didn't. Because the loss of the church, I know this is going to seem shocking when I say it, the loss of Christ and the loss of God None of those is the worst loss. None of those is the worst loss of the modern period. The worst loss happens after the end of the Second World War. A technology was invented before the Second World War. It was put on the shelf during the war because everything went into the war effort everywhere. By 1950 in America, by the year 1950, there were a million of these sold in one year. Do you know what I'm referring to? Televisions. Televisions. 
And in the, I don't have the statistics for Australia because I don't know if I mentioned this, I'm not from Australia. This is my second day ever in Australia. I don't know how many TVs you people have. Maybe you don't even watch TV. Do you? She, that lady does. Um, do you get Netflix? No, no Netflix, good for you. Uh, 2.3 televisions per household? You are pikers compared to us. <laughs> we have a television in every room and every family has a million rooms. That's what it's like in America. I don't know if you've been there. But the closets, we have TVs in the closets. All right, because you don't want to open the closet and miss something. So instead of turning back to God, Christ, and the church, we turned on the television and that was it. Instead of going back to Mass, we watched television news. And that communications technology just proliferated after that. And what happens if you have terrible trauma from two world wars, from the, the, the Holocaust of the Jewish people, from the destruction of, with nuclear weapons of, of two Japanese cities, and then the buildup of nuclear weapons such that uh, we actually... There's a movie where the entire world is destroyed by nuclear weapons except Australia. Have any of you ever seen that movie? I'm pretty sure you all made it. But, um, the, <laughs> the, but when I was a child, we grew up knowing that in 20 minutes the Russians could destroy all of America. That's how we grew up. You think that's not traumatizing? So at the same time that we're suppressing all of this trauma of what we've done to ourselves, we have this new opportunity of escape. And so we chose escape. That's what happened to the modern world. Instead of living real lives, we live through television and movies and all the other things that come through our screens. Right? I came to Australia with three screens. Like, I flew 15 hours on an airplane I don't know how many tons of fuel get burned just to carry people's... But I, I realized I'm here, I have three screens with me. That's weird, right? Columbus had a total of... They all, wait a second. <laughs> carry the two. Zero, okay? So, but we, I, like, I can't even come to... You have screens here. I probably don't need to bring any. Like, there's plenty here, but I brought three. Okay? Because that's... And we think that that's real life and everything else is trivial. So we have lost touch with reality. That is the greatest loss of the modern world. The modern world has lost contact with reality. It took a long time. It's not a new phenomenon. I myself believe that the demons have been at work on this for hundreds of years. But the ultimate end of all of this, the sundering of the church in 1517, the loss of the Christian God in favor of the deist God, the loss of God in favor of communism and Nietzscheanism and consumerism, and now the loss of reality. This is hundreds of years of demonic work in human history. And it all has one purpose. I am personally convinced of this. It has one purpose. Because you will notice that what has happened is hundreds of millions of Christians live their entire Christian lives never receiving Christ in the Eucharist. And hundreds of millions of others never receive Christianity at all because the church is so divided and a, and a mess and, and we, the church people, are so unwilling to face reality. We live unreal lives. From our perspective, the purpose of the modern world is progress. From the devil's perspective, the purpose of the, pro of the modern world is to cut people off from the Eucharist. That's what all of this is about. That we are cut off from Christ and the Eucharist. Because in Europe, from about the time of the last Roman emperors until... Martin Luther, the center of Christian life and civic life was in a church 
on your knees, receiving the incarnate God on your tongue. That thousand years of Eucharist gave us Bernard of Clairvaux and Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena and Gregory the Great. But it also gave us the, those who founded the universities and the hospitals, the nameless thousands and thousands and thousands. The greatest, weirdest, countercultural thing in the history of the world happened over the course of those, that thousand years. Hundreds and thousands, I don't, for all I know, it could be hundreds of thousands and millions of people voluntarily refused to marry, lived celibate lives in community with people of the same sex, praying, teaching, and healing. Also growing and repairing and creating art. And the monastic movement is, uh, to be frank, the weirdest thing that ever happened in the history of the world. And by the end of the medieval period, the monks and nuns had restored, they literally, I'm, I'm, literally, I'm not using the word literally the way Americans mostly use it. I mean literally had gone to Germany and invented a country. Like they dug it up out of the swamps. They created dams and waterways. They, they built an actual country. And it's probably physically the most beautiful country in the world after Australia. And <laughs> the, all right? That's what the monks and nuns did. And we mostly don't remember their names. That's not a revolution, right? That's a love affair. We think we need revolutions to make the world better. We don't. We need that love affair back. And I am convinced that the refounding of monasteries for men and women will be the key to the re-Christianizing or Christianizing of the world. It worked before, it'll work again. Because, and, and you might say, well, what about the family? Yes, right, that's true. But the family, even the family of Europe, the way the family came to be understood is a consequence of the ministry of of cloistered men and women who gave this example of sexual fidelity in the extreme and who educated those families and taught husbands how to be husbands and wives how to be wives. Some of the best wives of the Middle Ages. Here I'm not referring to Catherine of uh, Aquitaine, but the, some, of the, some of the best wives of the Middle Ages are people who were educated in those convent, uh, convent schools, wives and mothers, or educated by the monks locally, or sanctified by them. Because the monastery, you know, the, the church was an urban church before the monks. The monks went out into the wild. And then the wild people became Christian. And when the wild people became Christian, the world began to be transformed. And things like polyphonic music were invented. If you think the iPhone is a great invention, put some polyphonic music on your iPhone. That's the greatest invention. Or the Da Vinci's and the Michelangelo's. Or the Copernicus's, the Galileo's, the Isaac Newton's, the Gregor Mendel's. That's what we've lost. It's not, I really want to stress, I am not saying that we should go back to some golden era. The Middle Ages was not a golden era. I mean, they had a plague. And then they had another plague. And then they ended up, there's a lot of plagues, all right? We don't have a lot of plagues here now, right? So I'm not saying we need to go back to some lost golden era. What I am saying is there was a project that happened once. This project was a project to make the world fully human by putting humanity in intimate relationship with God, who loves them. That project was called Christendom. At its center was the Eucharist. And that project did not fail. It succeeded. And it gave the world those artistic, scientific, medical, liturgical gifts that the world received and then rejected. Not all at once, but over time. Rejected 
the communal shared liturgical life and then rejected the person of Jesus Christ as the real savior of the world, not just another religious teacher, but as the real savior of the world, and then rejected God because we can do this on our own. And then after all those rejections, attempted to commit suicide twice, and then having become so traumatized, let go of reality. We now live in a world where people are not connected to reality. I don't believe you can connect people to reality, myself, by saying, come back to reality. The primary mechanism for connecting people to reality is the mass, and the way we get them back to reality is give them the whole thing, 100%, all of it, come back to mass. Like Charbel said, come back to the saints and the angels, they're all around you. Come back to Christ and his church, come back to the Blessed Mother. Then you will find out what reality is. Then you will not be a victim of the endless modern revolutions, but you'll be able to settle down and live in a house and love those you live with and have a community and all those things that we have destroyed because none of those things can be had online. They require real physical presence. God became physically present in Jesus. After that rescue operation that started with Abraham, he took a patient century after patient century until in the fullness of time, God himself came to be among us. Yesterday, we were, when we first got here, we saw a lady doing a little reptile demonstration and she talked all about this reptile she had on her arm. And then a little boy at the front said, and they, she taught them all about this reptile. And the little boy at the front said, she had his question, yes, your question. He said, is it real? <laughs> Here's the deal. You can stay here all weekend and learn all this stuff, but you gotta know in your heart just what Charbel said. It is real. God did come. He did save us. He does love us. And there was a time when that project of sharing that love was taken out to all the world. We got to do it again. We got to do it again. In 19, I think it was 65, the new constitution on the church, the um, uh, Lumen Gentium, the church responded to everything that had happened up to that point, had lost reality and all that. And you know what the first words of that are? The first words of the constitution of the, on the church, the dogmatic constitution on the church from the Second Vatican Council. And these are the first words because this is what the council fathers said we have to offer. This is what we have left as Catholics. Here they are, the first words of the constitution of the Catholic Church. Jesus Christ is the light of the nations. That's the truth. Let's get out there. Thank you very much.